Welcome to the North Carolina College of Resuscitation. I'm Jamie Jollis. I'm a cardiologist at Duke University. Along with thousands of colleagues in North Carolina, we're all working to improve emergency cardiac care. I'm Chris Granger. I'm a cardiologist at Duke University. And I'd like to welcome you to this series of presentations on a very important project for the state of North Carolina, that is the Heart Rescue Project, or race cars. And this is the project to improve survival for patients with cardiac arrest by 50% over five years in the state of North Carolina. And it has a series of proven interventions that, that we need your help with that include interventions in the community to increase rates of bystander CPR and to educate the public to activate the EMS system when a cardiac arrest is, is identified. It, it involves the best practices by emergency medical services, um, including rapid application of defibrillation and best care in transportation and destination to the best centers able to care for patients with cardiac arrest, and then hospital measures that include primary PCI when that's indicated, therapeutic hypothermia, uh, and best care for patients with cardiac arrest during their hospital phase, including consideration for implantable defibrillators. And by doing all of these things, um, we believe that we can be very successful in improving survival for patients with cardiac arrest. So the topic this morning is hypothermia therapy, particularly in the pre-hospital environment. We started because of uh, this uh, kind of joke that went around in our uh, system. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen Monty Python and the Holy Grail, you need to go see this movie. Uh, in this particular case, uh, they are bringing out a potential future victim of the bubonic plague. Uh, and as you may recall, a third of the population of Europe was killed over a three-year time span uh, during this epidemic, and so it's uh, pretty brave of the Monty Python troop to make fun of this. Uh, but one of the things they learned is that from a public health perspective, you needed to move the dead bodies out of town to prevent future spread of the disease. So here this gentleman is being thrown onto the death cart, and he is screaming, I'm not dead yet. And the folks are saying from, you know, from an expeditionary standpoint, and say, well, it would be just much easier if you just go ahead now because we know you'll be dead soon enough. And for the past 30 to 35 years of resuscitation, this is what we have been doing in EMS. Unfortunately, we have been throwing folks onto the death cart. Were it not for a piece of plastic between their vocal cords, they could have screamed out to us, I'm not dead yet. And I think what we'll see is that very simple and focused therapies like hypothermia make a big difference in outcome. So we're going to try to not throw people onto the death cart. What we want to talk about then is why we're going to cool, when we're going to cool, who we're going to cool, and then finally, how to cool. And uh, we'll take each of those in, in turn and look at the evidence that's available to us. The first thing, you can't cool anybody until you know that you can resuscitate them. And it used to be that you only cooled after resuscitation, and as we'll see, that's probably not the case any longer. But regardless, you can't operate in the world of old CPR. And this is how we used to think, that you had to compress or you had to breathe. Those things had to be separated from one another. In point of fact, we now know that compressions can be done in an uninterrupted fashion or near uninterrupted fashion with interposed ventilations and it's just as effective, if not more effective, than the old 30 to 2, and I call it old even though it's the current guidelines, that's, that's going to be um, passed soon, I think. Um, but certainly 15 to 2 and 5 to 1 uh, are things that we were confused at a physiologic standpoint about resuscitation and we've learned from since then uh, that the continuous compressions are important. So once we have uh, continuous compressions and, a, and an effective resuscitation technique, why then choose hypothermia? We all have experienced patients who we achieve re return of spontaneous circulation and then move them to the hospital and they don't survive. Of that group, 10% die to recurrent dysrhythmias. Uh, and we all have experienced that. The patient's in fibrillation, they are defibrillated, they go back into fibrillation, we pick every antidysrhythmic out of the drug box, and you just cannot get the fib to break. The second group of folks, about 30% or so, have cardiovascular collapse. So they have a normal sinus rhythm on their EKG, but they're on four pressors. And you never can wean them off the pressors in the ICU, so they require this continuous pressure support, and they never can maintain their own blood pressure. But 40% die to neurologic impairment. They have a normal blood pressure, they have a normal EKG, but their brains don't work. 
And so it's this group, which is actually the largest reason for in-hospital post-cardiac arrest death, that we're going to focus on with our hypothermia therapy. Multiple papers published in 2002, and it's interesting we're doing this talk in 2012. The indictment against um, U.S. medicine is always takes 10 years from the time of good data to the change of patient care, so we're unfortunately right on time. Um, and the evidence is overwhelming that it, use of hypothermia, post-arrest, and ventricular fibrillation VF arrest, that group uh, improves neurologic outcome and it is sustained over several days. This is uh, one of the two major papers from the New England Journal in 2002. And then the next slide here is just kind of a compilation of multiple studies. You can see the ones in the box at the bottom are the two large studies from the New England Journal. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail. They're here for you and, and your review. I just want to point out one thing about them. In all of these highlighted areas, the hypothermic group is to the left and the normothermic group is to the right. And as we go through each study, you will see that the hypothermia group always was better than the normothermia group. There have never been negative hypothermia trials for VFVT. I want to say that one more time. Never been a negative trial. It's very few therapies that exist in medicine for which there's not a counterbalancing negative trial at some point. We'll talk about other rhythms later, but for VFVT, it's, it's pretty clear that this is, this is the way to go. Uh, so I want to now compare this to other therapies that we have taken to be the standard of care. And I want to talk about the number needed to treat concept briefly and then we'll go through some comparisons. So the number needed to treat concept gives you the power of your therapy. For example, there has never been a case of streptococcal pharyngitis that is resistant to IM penicillin. So every time you give 1.2 million units of bicillin, you cure streptococcal pharyngitis. So the number needed to treat is one. It's a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So that's a very powerful therapy for that disease. Number needed to treat is one. Conversely, if we stay in the infectious disease realm, we now have multiple resistance uh, among gonorrhea strains. And so if you use Cipro, which used to be the standard treatment for that, the number needed to treat is more like one to four, one to five, meaning that it's not going to work three or four or five times out of a five-time treatment. So that's a less powerful therapy at a number needed to treat of one to five. So if we come then and compare hypothermia to some standard therapies, we can see the magnitude of benefit. The number needed to treat for hypothermia is six, meaning that for every six cases of VFVT who are not neurologically intact that we cool, somebody's going to walk out of the hospital neurologically intact that otherwise would not have done so. So again, the number needed to treat six, one out of six will do better that otherwise would not have. Let's compare that to aspirin for MI. The number needed to treat is 25. In other words, you have to treat 25 patients before you see that benefit. However, if you as an EMS agency, you as an in-hospital provider, do not provide aspirin for a patient having a myocardial infarction. Your name goes in the government database and you are on hospitalcompare.gov website as being a poor care provider, even though the magnitude of benefit is four times less than it is for hypothermia. Likewise, if you don't give a beta blocker in the first 24 hours after an MI, the number needed to treat there is 42. But if you don't provide that beta blocker, same thing, you're on the list, all the rest. Finally, the cath facility within 90 minutes. If your door to balloon is 90 minutes or less versus 90 minutes or greater, you have to do that 15 times before you can confer a benefit on the patient. However, we all know what every hospital's door to balloon time is. That's kind of the, the, the walking around number that we walk around with. My prediction is that very soon, if not already, we're going to be in the same situation with hypothermia. We are going to know which hospitals do hypothermia for which types of patients, how rapidly they cool them, what their complication rates are, because the magnitude of benefit of hypothermia is greater than any of those other three if you look at just the objective data that's available. The side effects, nothing's perfect. I think the first thing to remember about hypothermia is from all the studies and the top two are highlighted there is that there's no difference in overall side effect in the hypothermia group versus the normothermia groups. These side effects are different and they are predictable in the hypothermia arm, but the overall incidence of bad side effects during hospital admission is unchanged. So if we move, for example, to potassium shifts. We know that as you cool the patient, potassium moves inside the cell. As you warm the patient, potassium comes outside the cell. This just means you need to have the protocols correct in the ICU uh, to correct when the potassium is very low, but not as often as you might under normal circumstances. 
you will actually tolerate some, hypo, some uh, hypokalemia below three on occasion, uh, which makes people very nervous, but we know as soon as we start rewarming, the potassium is going to rise again. Um, so uh, interesting times in the ICU for some folks. There's a cold-induced diuresis. All you have to do is maintain the fluid balance. You have to remember to temperature correct your blood gases. Blood glucose can go up. What we have found is that that's kind of an independent predictor of badness. Um, if you have difficulty controlling blood glucose in that first 24 to 36 hours, uh, that's just a sign of poor overall function and, and uh, can be uh, predictive of bad outcome. Patients do experience a neutropenia, and there is some small evidence that they also have slightly increased risk of in-hospital pneumonia. Uh, Good ventilator acquired pneumonia therapy, uh, elevating the head of the bed 30 degrees, suctioning, all the things that we know work, seem to really decrease this uh, risk for this patient population, but it is certainly known. Uh, the last two are the ones that we really focus on. Uh, coagulopathy, we know that the coagulation cascade is slightly altered during the induction phase. What is interesting is once the patient achieves target temperature, their coagulation profile seems to be normal, but in the first two to four to maybe even as far out as six hours, your uh, PT, PTTs will prolong and there's some difficulty with clotting. So that's something we have to monitor, particularly if this therapy is considered for trauma patients or head injured patients. And then finally, there are cardiac dysrhythmias. Almost every patient who's at temperature is in sinus bradycardia. Uh, it's not unusual to see patients with pulses in the 30s, uh, maintaining normal blood pressures and those do not require treatment. Uh, what you do see is that in the temperature change phases in the induction of hypothermia and in the rewarming phase, you can have every dysrhythmia that we know, tachy dysrhythmias, brady dysrhythmias, and so forth. Those patients do better with slower temperature movement. So what we have learned is that rather than move somebody at a degree an hour, you move them at half a degree centigrade an hour. If you see cardiac dysrhythmias, you back that down to 0.25 degrees centigrade an hour, and those tend to correct themselves without any other interventions. So. All things being said, this is the risk-benefit ratio. Uh, these are patients who are profoundly ill. We have risks that we know and then we can predict, but the benefit is potentially huge. And so it, it's definitely in favor of providing the therapy in the VFVT group, and we'll talk about other rhythms in a little while. So what has taken so long? If this is such a good therapy and it was known 10 years ago, the cynical side of me says this, it is the lack of money is the root of all evil, um, that the uh, compare this to Viagra, for example. Our good friends at Pfizer made $2 billion with a B last year on the little blue pill. So they had reason to advertise and uh, a capitalistic reason to make money. And capitalism is a good thing, don't get me wrong. But this therapy is so inexpensive that nobody's going to make $2 billion selling you a widget to do hypothermia. So we have to move the needle, if you will, to increase the utilization of hypothermia on the back of good patient care, good evidence, cost savings, better patient outcome, not by the commercial pharmaceutical ind uh, industry supporting us as we go along. For us, for example, our EMS agency responds to about 80,000 calls a year. We have a $28 million a year budget. It costs $5,000 for us to start hypothermia and it costs $4 a patient to provide the therapy. Uh, did not even have to fill out a budget form, right, to do this. In hospital cost, likewise. Uh, it cost about $100,000 to start this up for our two, two major receiving hospitals. One of those receiving hospitals, just to turn on the lights, bring everybody to work, and operate the main campus for 24 hours is $1.5 million a day to run that campus. So for them, $100,000 may sound like a lot of money, and it is, but in hospital speak, it's not that much money. And then it costs about $1,000 a patient. So for both the pre-hospital and in-hospital components, this is what we refer to as institutional budget dust. And so there's nobody there uh, trying to, to glean those dollars for their company, and I think that's in large part what has taken this so long. So in my mind, the, the notion of should we be providing hypothermia for VFVT patients is, is done. Yes, we should. The question now is, when should we start? Should it be during CPR? Should it be right after we return a pulse? Should it be in the emergency department? Or should it be in the ICU? There's data to help us kind of muddle our way through it at the moment. There is no definitive answer to that question today. The next question is, who should receive this therapy? We've talked about VFVT. Should we use it in PAA systole? And then 
uh, beyond the scope of this talk, but we need to be thinking about the traumatically injured patient stroke, head injury, and MI. So, <clears throat> hot off the press, there are two articles. I'm going to uh, use this one, and then Bernard has one to follow that I'll describe for you. Uh, both of these articles compared EMS provision of hypothermia with in-hospital provision of hypothermia. And, they, and the in-hospital phase was in the emergency department. In both of these studies that we're going to talk about, there was no intra-arrest hypothermia. So it was not that EMS was providing hypothermia during CPR. They were providing it immediately after return of pulse versus immediately on arrival in the emergency department. These individuals have been doing cooling for a long time. This is one of the two communities from that original paper back in 2002. So they are well versed in hypothermia. Uh, this uh, paper is from Circulation in 2010. There's another paper uh, by the same group from Circulation early in this past year. What we can see and what's important here is that they look at the group that was, had paramedic cooling versus in-hospital cooling. Not surprisingly, <clears throat> the initial temperature on the scene is about 36 degrees. We find this to be true in our community and in every other published paper during the uh, actual decreased circulation that comes from cardiac arrest you will have a drop of about one degree in normal body temperature so normal temperature is 37 you will yourself fall to about 36 just by the fact you're in cardiac arrest we then come down to the initial temperature on hospital arrival and obviously doing the pre-hospital hypothermia move the temperature by 0.8 degrees so they did move it, but as you come down just below that and you look at the temperature 30 minutes after arrival, the temperatures are essentially the same, 34.4 versus 34.8 degrees. Statistically different, but clinically it's hard to argue that 0.4 degrees centigrade has any true clinical meaning. So what this study essentially said is that if you give cold fluid right after you get a pulse back in the pre-hospital environment and have short transport times and give it immediately on arrival in the emergency department, there's essentially no difference in temperature. So not surprisingly then, when you come to results, there's essentially no difference in outcome. Uh, there was no conferred benefit from EMS providing the hypothermia therapy versus the rapid in-hospital provision. This was VFVT groups, the paper I'm alluding to from 2012, this very recently off the press, looked at PA and asystole and essentially came to the same conclusion. Um, that if you provide pre-hospital hypothermia in a rapid system of transport with a rapid ED utilization of, of treatment, there is little in the way of difference. The question we have to ask ourselves is, how is this externally applicable? Most communities cannot move patients to target temperature in the emergency department within 30 minutes. Uh, we have been doing it in Wake County now since October of 2006, and in our best day, we're at target temperature about 90 minutes after arrival. Uh, but it just takes that long to do. So we're just to compare apples to oranges. So. We're not sure about the pre-hospital post-ROSC business. That's kind of the best data that we have, and it shows that the treatments are basically equivocal. But what about during CPR? Uh, should we actually be starting cardiac arrest with cold fluid? Again, the answer is not definitive yet, but I want to go through a couple of um, indications that perhaps it's better to cool during CPR. So these are animal trials. And what they are looking at is the deficit score. The higher that deficit score, the worse the neurologic outcome, and the histologic score the same. So the deficit score was a, an examination of the animals after their arrest, an external physical exam. The histologic score is at pathology looking actually at the CNS tissue to see what the destruction was. The normothermia group received no treatment at all as far as hypothermia is uh, concerned. The immediate treatment group received hypothermia during the arrest. The delayed treatment group received hypothermia 15 minutes later. So there was the, the difference between immediate and delayed in this animal study was only 15 minutes. And this is a graphical representation of that study. So there was no flow, then the arrest, and then you can see in the dotted line there is the group that got early hypothermia. The solid line there is the group that got delayed hypothermia. And you can see the difference in time there is only 15 minutes. And when you look at this group, and this is a sco score with which we hope we all become familiar, the CPC score one through five, one being normal, 
too minimal deficit in the human population means uh, able to hold a part-time job. That is the, the way that is described. Uh, CPC score of three is assistance with activities of daily living, but it able to communicate. CPC of four is persistent vegetative state, which is the, probably the worst one on the whole list. And CPC of five is brain death. And as you can see in the delayed hypothermia group in this uh, animal study, 15 minutes of delay, all the animals but one had brain death. Whereas in the early hypothermia group, five of the eight animals were in what would be the good category, ones and twos. What is also interesting is when you look at these animal models, you can see that patients with early hypothermia, in this case animals with early hypothermia, trended toward more rapid resuscitation. And we'll come back to this in just a little while. But the total number of countershocks required in the delayed hypothermia group on average was 13. In the early hypothermia group was eight, excuse me, was one. As you can see, most of this does not reach statistical significance to the p-value to the right, but the trend is always in favor. And the two areas where it does reach statistical significance are on the lines of total epinephrine, 2.45 versus 0.75, so the, the code was so much shorter, we had to give much less epinephrine. And then perhaps the only one that matters, as you come to the bottom, the survival group, statistically significant, 21 hours on average for the delayed group, 96 on average for the early group, and this study terminated at 96 hours. So 96 was the maximum survival, and that was the average survival in the early hypothermia group. So um, the things that matter, it seems to work. Will the defibrillator work? And I think the evidence here would demonstrate that in point of fact, the defibrillator works better at 33 degrees than it does at 37. And this is counterintuitive to the classic teaching from ACLS, be gentle, don't defibrillate. That is at extreme hypothermia. Temperatures of 28 degrees and less. We are talking about moving from 37 to 33 degrees and mild hypothermia uh, indeed appears to confer improved defibrillation. Uh, if you look, these just show that the selected energy levels to, for sh shock success are very similar. So you are not having to increase the um, energy level to achieve shock success. What we are seeing, though, is that in the hypothermia group, the dark group there, at similar energy levels, you are achieving better shock success at 33 degrees versus at 37 degrees. And this is one of those papers that got lost in the shuffle. I, I think this is a, an amazingly elegant and simple paper from circulation in 2005 that should draw all of our attention to how uh, hypothermia may affect defibrillation. If you look at the percent of first shot success at, and, and we run these temperatures for you, they're 37 at normal thermia, mild is 35, moderate is 33, severe is 31. So they're two degrees each as you go across. At 33 degrees, at the target temperature for our therapy, the first shot success rate was the highest at above 70%. If you then look at the proportion of all patients who achieved sustained ROSC, patients who had moderate hypothermia during the resuscitation had the best chance of achieving sustained ROSC. And then finally, we want to know, do the drugs work? The bottom line is the drugs work as well. You, so drugs are not going to be ineffective at 33 degrees. They may not work as well at 28, but 33 seems to be just fine. This is just a graph of the study. That the notion of the study is that the patients actually here went all the way down to 22 degrees uh, to, to make the extreme point that the drugs will work. Um, note, with after you give epinephrine, you get an increase in coronary perfusion pressure, which you would think indicates that epinephrine is working. And then I think this slide was sponsored by amiodarone, but the notion being that as you move from no treatment to epinephrine, you get an increased ROSC, you add an antidysrhythmic, and that goes up again, again indicating that the medications are working even at that low degree. So the summary now of when. Most evidence suggests earlier is better. Now, I have a caveat that's, that's not in this slide for a paper that literally is hot off the press uh, has, and has received quite a bit of press um, and will probably put it in um, as, a, as an add-on at the end. Uh, very, very recent paper. Uh, it was 17 hospitals in an Italian study. What they uh, looked at was patients who achieved target temperature at less than two hours versus more than two hours. And, and this was all post-ROSC group patients, so no intra-arrest cooling. And in this study, what they demonstrated is patients that achieved temperatures less than two hours did not do as well as those more than two hours. The issue is that patients who 
have more severe brain injury, their temperature falls faster uh, because they don't have that control. So we're, it is very unclear. This was not a randomized trial. This was simply an observational study. Um, so we need to take that into account. That will be counterbalanced with the paper being written by FDNY right now that shows an absolute increase in return of spontaneous circulation of, of 4% by using intra-rest cooling. So in other words, their ROSC rate went up from 24 to 28% by cooling intra-rest. Both of the, the FDNY paper is not published yet, um, and the other one is very recently off the press. So I just want to note that this is an area of, of intense study at the moment, but what we know now is that the preponderance of the evidence suggests that earlier attempts at cooling are better with the caveat that the patients whose temperature falls off very quickly may be a predictor of poor outcome. It appears that we should, suggest, we should uh, consider induction during the resuscitation uh, and then certainly immediately after VFVT, immediately after ROSC, and then perhaps for other rhythms as well. So I want to go now into what about which other types of patients besides VFVT should be cooled. Um, <clears throat> we uh, here in our community have looked recently at survival trends for non-VFVT. Um, and our control group had continuous cardiac compressions plus the impedance threshold device. Our um, experimental group, and again, this is historical observation trial, controlled, car uh, excuse me, continuous cardiac compressions, ITD, plus hypothermia. And we looked for the non-VFVT patients. So these are PEA and asystole. Uh, and their ROSC rate rose from 7.6% to 38.2%, and their discharge rate went from 1.5 to 5%. Again, you don't want PA and asystole. You'd rather have VFVT. But we also are now seeing movement in this patient group. And I can tell you anecdotally, the vast majority of that is from the PEA group. Uh, the groups are so small that statistically you can't divide them. But the trend appears to be the, the magnitude of the benefit is coming from the PEA group. So why should we cool an EMS? It does appear that earlier induction may be beneficial. It is inexpensive. There is no evidence that it caused harm. It may improve success of our ventricular fibrillation treatment. Those are all good reasons. But the real reason is we cannot trust the hospital to institute the treatment in all of our eligible patients. Uh, I work in the hospital. I love the folks that work in the hospital. But the issue is there is what I refer to as hospital inertia. If the treatment is ongoing when you cross over the hospital threshold doors, it is likely to continue. If the treatment has not been started, somebody somewhere can find a reason not to start it. Uh, unpublished data from Australia indicates that approximately 25% of eligible patients will not be treated if it's not started in the pre-hospital environment. And then we'll go over some data that FDNY has been so kind to share with us uh, about their experience. This is the FDNY experience with cooling. They have 42 receiving hospitals who are providing hypothermia in the greater New York City area. You can see that some of the hospitals, hospitals one, two, three, and four toward the left, have had very few cases of hypothermia, whereas some of the major receiving centers to the right, 40, 41, and 42, have done 70 cases in a six month time frame. So you can see that the, the experience is variable. They are cooling like we do here in Wake County and like most are doing across the country now, every rhythm, uh, in the absence of known ongoing hemorrhage, and even some of their hemorrhages have been cooled. We talked earlier about the coagulopathy, particularly in the first two hours, so that's a, a contraindication for us. But <clears throat> you can see that they, they are cooling just about every rhythm. Um, you can see that the patients who survive uh, are, e are mostly non-VFVT, even though um, the VF are the ones most likely to, simply by the overwhelming majority of patients who are not in VFVT at the time of, of the arrest. This paper uh, is just like all of the results that we have seen in almost every published paper. 75% of patients who have induced hypothermia leave the hospital neurologically intact. Um, so the notion that hypothermia is going to create magnitudes of people with persistent vegetative state who end up in nursing homes is just not supported by the evidence. The evidence suggests it is much more like a light switch. The therapy either is effective, 75%, you leave, or it's ineffective and you have brain death. <clears throat> this is the, the take home message here is about patients who were not cooled by EMS and were and presented to a hypothermia hospital. 
they had a list of contraindications which are off to your right. So the patient had refra refractory, hypoxia, refractory, hypotension, so forth and so on. They were not eligible to receive the therapy. However, 15% of eligible patients were not treated when EMS did not start hypothermia. So today in New York City, if you have a cardiac arrest, you will have intra-arrest hypothermia for all comers, all patients. Part of it is for the reasons we previously discussed, the benefits of intra-arrest cooling, and part of it is because of this finding here. So what's actually going on? Where are we across the country? We recently conducted um, a Metropolitan Medical Director survey, asked uh, representatives from all of these communities, what are you doing with hypothermia today? And this is what we found. Four communities were doing uh, ice saline during CPR. 11 communities were doing ice saline at the time of return of pulse. One group was actually doing ice packs and other external cooling during CPR. Two others were doing it at the time of return of spontaneous circulation. Five had plans, only four had no plans for cooling. So the vast majority from the Metro survey were doing some type of pre-hospital hypothermia, um, some intra-arrest, some post-ROSC. Almost all facilities had a destination guide, excuse me, all communities had a destination guide to facilities that would provide PCI cooling and mostly PCI cooling and both. Only three of the communities had no destination guide. So clearly the trend is moving toward pre-hospital cooling and a destination guide to ensure that your patients are receiving the therapy that they need. I want to show some examples now of, of the ways you can do this within the hospital and then in the pre-hospital environment. Uh, I encourage communities to have a standard set of orders. Um, the notion here is that wherever the patient arrests, if they arrest on the floor of the hospital, if they arrest in the ICU, if they arrest in the community, if they arrest in a doctor's office, it does not matter. They're going to come into this order set at the same place and receive the same treatment. And these are all public. Uh, Wake Med and Rex are two um, receiving facilities in Wake County utilize the exact same protocol set. So everybody's welcome to those as a, as a draft to help. This is uh, what I call the doctor-proof protocol set. Uh, you notice that everything that's important is already pre-checked. Um, you allow the physician to make decision about the maintenance fluid rate, uh, how important that is, we could have some argument. Uh, and then labs that they might want in addition to those that are already set to be done. So if a physician feels like they need to make some decisions in the first 24 hours, they can. But otherwise, the basic part of the therapy is established. If you look at number four there, this is just an example of what we want in all of these protocols. Uh, the last parenthetical statement there, omit if already given by EMS. So we are ready to come into this protocol wherever the patient may be in their treatment and move them through the rest of the therapy. And that's just the rest of, of those. So how do you convince the hospitals to put one of those in place? That's kind of a difficult thing. Um, you got to identify the stakeholders. And I will tell you that nurses run hospitals. And if you think physicians and administrators run hospitals, you have another thought coming. Um, and so the way that you move your hospital is you take the nursing staff that's going to be responsible for caring for these patients, find the leaders in that staff, and then bring your physician and administrative groups with them. But you obviously need to have the key nursing staff at the, at the table. ED, nursing and physician cardiology, you need cath lab and CCU because we're going to be doing these during cooling, uh, doing cardiac cath, so everybody needs to understand how that's going to work. The nurses from the ICU, and we'll talk about that in a moment, Neurology, Pharmacy, and Hospital Administration. Those are the folks you need to have around the table. And here are some examples of the old habits that you're going to have to fight. If patients go, or excuse me, if, if any of those individuals, the stakeholders, go to those 2002 studies, their temptation is going to be to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study and make that the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the patient population they're seeing. That sometimes work, it doesn't work well here, and here's one example. In one of those studies, the resuscitation had to be started between 5 and 15 minutes after the collapse. We don't always know that information. And so it may well be that your EMS provider is going to write down CPR started immediately. Well, those patients still should be eligible to receive the therapy. Did the entire code last greater than 60 minutes? Well, again, if once you have ROSC and the patient re-arrest, does that restart the clock? Does that not restart the clock? It can become very confusing. So you have to take the 
inclusion and exclusion criteria and take each one of them line by line and either define them explicitly or remove them. And I think what you'll see as we go along is we, we remove them when we talk to our, our hospital stakeholders. I talked earlier about ICU nursing and that we needed to revisit that, that disparate experience with induced hypothermia. In our facility um, in, at Wake County at Wake Med, and it, same experience happened to some extent at Rex, is that when patients were admitted with VFVT arrest, they went to the cardiac intensive care unit. When they were admitted with PAA systole arrest, they went to the medical intensive care unit. And as we saw, even in the greatest of circumstances, the discharge rate for PAA systole is 5%. Our discharge rate for VFVT now approaches 50%. So there was a tenfold difference in experience from the nurses in the CCU versus the nurses in the medical intensive care unit. Once we brought those folks together and let them talk with one another about their experience, the medical intensive care unit folks became more enthusiastic about the therapy, but they just need to know it's working somewhere. Uh, and so it's very easy to get siloed and forget that. The immediate post-resuscitation neurologic exam, if there is nothing that we get out of this section of the talk, I hope people can remember that unless it is normal, the immediate post-resuscitation neurologic exam is useless. Uh, a patient who's awake and talking to you, that's great to know. Otherwise, it has no prognostic value of any kind. Uh, and and I, we can say it now, we couldn't say it then, but one of the reasons we used paralysis early in our program was to prevent the immediate post-resuscitation neurologic exam because the patient comes in paralyzed with vecuronium, nobody can examine them. We got a lot of complaints, but it also forced people to omit this useless examination. There are two papers that support this, one of which I walked around with in my back pocket for two years. Don't have to do it anymore because people understand where we're coming from now. Um, and this is the paper, Neurology 2006, and it goes through line by line what we need to do about these examinations. Anoxia time, duration of CPR, cause of cardiac arrest. All of these have relation to poor outcome, but none of them will reliably discriminate enough for you to make a call about continuing resuscitation versus not. So if somebody says, well, they were down for umpty up minutes, there's no evidence to support that. Elevated body temperature, it's bad. If immediately after you have a pulse back, you spike a fever, that indicates your thermoregulatory center in your brainstem is not working well. But there have been patients with that problem who do well. So you cannot, again, use this reliably. The only things that work is myoclonic status epilepticus. That does not require a neurologic exam. You can walk by the bed to know that. Otherwise, absent pupillary reflexes, absent corneal reflexes, extension motor responses are at one to three days. And so it's really 72 hours at a minimum before any neurologic conclusion can be made. What is interesting is that all of these guidelines are pre-hypothermia guidelines. So what we believe now is that it's at least five days before you can make any determination because the hypothermia therapy is the first two. Um, takes 24 to cool you, 12 to rewarm you, another 12 to stabilize. So the first 48 hours are just dealing with the hypothermia component. Um, so we really uh, discourage people and in our facilities now, neurology doesn't come until 72 hours. Um, there's just nothing that they can tell you uh, that's meaningful till after that time frame, and this is just did on a flow chart. Um, so, again, I, I know I've said it multiple times, I'll say it one more time. The initial post resuscitation exam is not predictive of outcome, so don't let people fool you. Uh, and as an anecdote, you can remember if, if you are still using atropine for cardiac arrest, which we could argue whether you should or you shouldn't, but if you are, people's are going to be fixed and dilated, by definition, for 24 hours. Okay, so let's talk about the mechanics of how you actually cool people in the street. We bring the cold fluid in a, in a simple cooler. This is how we kept our cost low. Uh, we place this only on supervisor vehicles uh, and advanced practice paramedic cars. Uh, FDNY, for example, bought these coolers for every piece of rolling stock. So there, there are multiple ways to get at that. Uh, I'm a big fan of the checklist and the card. Uh, this gives you how and when. Uh, there's nothing to be ashamed of about using the checklist. As a matter of fact, it should be a matter of pride because you want to make sure that patient receives everything they're supposed to receive. Here's just some examples of the equipment which is uh, easily stored and transported. Um, the bottom line is if it's not simple, it simply won't be done. Uh, and we've just got to make this as simple as humanly possible. So this is how we started back in 2006 with all of these criteria for exclusion and exclusion. Uh, and for reasons we've already talked about. 
If you had trauma or hemorrhage, you could not cool because of the worry about coagulopathy. There's little data about pediatrics. We'll hit that in just a moment. Uh, we were afraid to do it for pregnant women just because we were scared. Um, there was no evidence one way or the other. Uh, we need to make sure the initial temperature was okay and the patient had to be intubated and had no purposeful response to pain. So that's where we started with all those exclusion criteria. That was then, this is now. We've made it much more simple. No trauma, no hemorrhage, good temperature, no purposeful response to pain. The new guideline that we're going to institute next month clarifies purposeful, purposeful response to pain because that's in the eye of the beholder in a lot of individuals and now is consistent with the AHA guidelines, follows verbal command. So unless the patient will lift one finger to command, then they're eligible for cooling because the purposeful response to pain can be ambiguous. So we're going to clarify that. This is the old protocol, uh, the initial one, and in that protocol, um, we gave everyone vecuronium and Versed, then gave the cold fluid. There was no intra-arrest cooling considered, and then we were aggressive, as we still are, to uh, increase the mean arterial pressure to 90 to 100. That's not a systolic, that's the mean. Um, we believe very strongly that the post-resuscitation patient needs flow, uh, and so we, we work very aggressively to do that. This is our current protocol. Up to the left, you can see consider intra-arrest cooling, and the only reason it says consider is in case you start the code before the cold fluid gets there, we don't want you to be in a protocol violation. So the consideration is just considers the fluid there, and if it's there, you go with it. And then you can see we only do paral paralyzation and sedation if the patient has shivering. And what we have found is doing intra-arrest cooling markedly reduces your shivering post-ROSC. So we very rarely have to sedate it. I think we've paralyzed one patient in the past year, maybe two out of the 150 or so that have undergone this therapy. So uh, intra-arrest cooling is just very simple and much easier to do. So does this actually work? And we'll talk about this and, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up. Uh, we did a community-wide experiment, uh, perspective data collect, uh, collection and observation. In the first phase, we moved from 15 to 2 compressions to continuous compressions. In the second phase, we moved to controlled ventilations and working all the codes in the field. And we'll be addressing the reasons for that in a separate presentation. Uh, but the, for the purposes of this, it was just to ensure those continuous compressions were working. And then in phase three, we induced hypothermia. So that's the three phases of the trial you're getting ready to see. If we look at our results in the, the solid line, vertical line there in the middle, means there's no difference in your therapy. So for age and years, you can see that the odds of survival decreases, but it decreases by a very small amount per age and years, by 0.03. So age is predictive, but it is not nearly as strongly predictive as some might think. We have cooled uh, patients as young as a year and as old as 88. So the, the gamut is, is there. Bystander witness arrest, your odds of survival are 2.7 to 1, which is not surprising. If those bystanders are so kind as to push on your chest, again, they a little over double your odds of survival. If you have an initial shockable rhythm, we all know how well predictive that is, uh, consistent with previous studies, uh, seven-fold increase in survivability. Then as we come to our first phase, we doubled your odds of survival. Phase two was short because we were able to move hypothermia earlier than we thought, and, and once we were ready, we implemented that. And so you can see in phase three, continuous compressions, work the code on the scene, control ventilations, and provide hypothermia, your odds of survival are quadrupled compared to baseline. And this is essentially free therapy. This is change in process, uh, not spending a lot of money to acquire new pieces of equipment. And again, as we discussed before, the CPC scores one and two, 76% of our survivors were in that group. Um, so even though we had more survivors, we had more patients neurologically intact, so we, we still feel confident that we're not filling the nursing homes with patients in persistent vegetative state. To look at this another way, it increased our survival actually by 7% and relatively by 200%. This is an increase in three lives saved per 100,000 population per year, which at the time that we made this slide was 25 patients a year in Wake County. It's now 30 as the population has grown. So, but it's three patients per 100,000 per year, increased sa um, savings compared to previous. So in summary, with proper monitoring, there are very few complications associated with hypothermia. There's substantial evidence of benefit. Treatment is inexpensive, and I'm not sure what we're waiting for.
Thank you very much.